All right, I'm back in plenary session. I'm joined via Zoom by Dr. Nathan Pearson. Nathan Pearson is a genomicist, and he is a listener of plenary session. Nathan, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. It's a pleasure, as they, as they say, like, you know, long-time listener and uh, first-time Zoom chatter. <laughs> well, we look forward to chatting. So, you know, you messaged me, and we were going to talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 and the genomics around it. So I wonder if you might might kick it off. Tell us, um, you know, um, what what your interest is, what you heard, and 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 what you want to push back on. Well, I think it's um, I so basically one of your prior guests was talking about you know tr- you know you've been grappling with how to understand this pandemic for a long time, <clears throat> and the prospect that human genomes might matter, that our own DNA may figure in who gets the disease, uh, what symptoms they get, uh, how how well they respond to a preventive measure or a treatment. That came up, and you and your guest, you, I, I can't recall the guest, forgive me, um, but dismissed uh, any emerging evidence on that as being you know, basically that there was there was nothing turning up in our own genomes. And uh, because I work closely on that, I wanted to, to make sure that listeners did get a chance to hear about what we are learning. Okay. Uh, and also temper that, because to your guest's point, actually, the insights from our own genomes are quite modest. And so um, everything else that you've been grappling with causally in the pandemic, it, environmental exposures, it's especially access to treatment and, and, and to screening, et cetera, all of those things uh, likely matter apparently much more than common genetic spellings do in our own genomes. Nonetheless, I wanted to have a chance to, to walk with you and, and listeners through what we are learning from some great worldwide efforts on that. I look forward to it. And just for the record, I uh, I didn't have an opinion because I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, so you, you tell me. Always reserve judgment. You you reserve judgment. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, but those efforts have been ongoing, and and I think it's also important to recognize that you know, like everybody in in your field, our field, many fields, people have rallied to, to bringing their own expertise to understanding the pandemic um, as the elephant to which we you know we all have something to say about it in the dark. Um. And geneticists, human geneticists, looking not at the RNA of, of the virus and how it varies necessarily, but at our own DNA, um, you know, rallied to that call. So I work with colleagues in a, a global consortium called the COVID HG, COVID Host Genetics Consortium. Um, we have a forthcoming preprint that you'll read about soon, but that effort has really been yeoman work um, from many, many big population health basins and researchers from Burkina Faso to Paraguay, from Iran to Israel. So there, the people are collaborating um, to, to help understand this across vast distances, um, and importantly, looking at, at very disparate populations, both in terms of their own genetics and, and environments, but also across political boundaries in ways that are really heartening and have proved fruitful. That's I just wanted to recognize that that you know I I come as one of those hundreds of people who have. Who have stepped up from our field to do that. That's that's fascinating. I look forward to the preprint. So tell me, give me the sneak preview. What did you find? Okay, so what we do, basically, we, we look across many people's genomes, and we start with looking at common genetic spelling. So this is so-called GWAS, or gen- genome-wide association studies. Basically, the, they look at kind of a reader's digest of each person's genome. So what common spellings do they carry at each of about a million spots scattered all over their chromosomes? And I say common spellings because those are the ones that are kind of statistically tractable early on. Rare, very rare spellings may matter, but it, they, they take different statistical methods to try to tease apart um, for that. So first we look at the common spellings and ask where in our genomes, where on our chromosomes do the spellings that a person carry carries do they correlate most uh, strongly with whether they get infected if exposed or don't get infected? That is whether, are they susceptible or do they resist uh, catching the virus? And if they do catch it, what symptoms ensue? So do they get severely sick? Do they only get mildly sick? Do they eventually, we can start to ask questions like, do they respond to a particular treatment, et cetera? That, that takes longer time, but that's the question we ask. So we scan across a, a bunch of people's genomes and we've now looked at dozens of thousands of, co- of you know, well-ascertained COVID-19 patients in many countries. That's important too. So you, you can disentangle real genetic, genetic effects from the ones that merely reflect ancestry and or other facets of demography. Uh, demography. So you, know, you, you don't want to confuse 
uh, um, environmental exposures that track with ethnicity mm -hmm. with the genetic spellings that do. So, so we look across many basins of patients and we say, what spellings and where are they when, when somebody uh, that, that correlate with somebody resisting or, or getting the disease or getting symptoms? And we, see, we look for peaks. So you end up with this big plot of many of all of our chromosomes, well, the autosomes in particular, the, the non-XY or mitochondrial chromosomes. And we, we call it a Manhattan plot because the, the sort of ideal one is, it looks a little bit like a city skyline Skyscraper. where most of it yeah. is actually kind of a flat uh -huh. Yeah, we well, it looks less. Ideally, they look less like Manhattan, which is kind of a chaotic jumble with you know Trump towers going up and and falling apart everywhere, um, and more like Dubai. Uh, more like a, uh, maybe a city. Yeah, I was going to say Dubai is like the classic <laughs> one now, where there's a few. Uh -huh. You look uh -huh. for a few kind of anchor spikes that are uh -huh. really telling you something strong, above a nice kind of like uh, quiet baseline, and when we do that there are some really intriguing spikes that show up and they show up both significantly overall and reproducibly across studies. And that's really important. So, um, and so you, you know, you can get a hint from one study and you want to make sure that it replicates either in a similar population or in a very different one. And it's important that they do. So some of these spikes, especially the one we'll talk most about on chromosome three have replicated really strongly now. Now that said, so they, they, they turn out to be robustly significant. That is, our genetic spellings, the common spellings that people carry, correlate significantly with who gets sick or severely sick at a few spots in our genomes. That's a different question, as you know, from effect size. Right. So you can have a very strong effect. Sorry, you can have a very significant effect that robustly shows up in study after study, but less modest in, in effect size. And that's what we're seeing. So on chromosome three, for example, which is the most, uh, the kind of the, 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 the Burj Dubai, that's the really, the, the big spike that we see so far, it's a little mysterious spot on the shorter arm of the two on chromosome three. Yes. Um, and it shows up in study after study. None of these genotypes that you could carry at one of these spikes confers an apparent risk of severe COVID-19 that deviates more than about twofold from the population average. Well, let me so ask you, the, odds ratios, what's we throw the, these into a standard. Yeah. What's the end point you're looking at? Incident COVID or are you looking at um, severe COVID or death from COVID? Which one are you looking at? Several. So so we have, and, and folks can go review a data dictionary that, that looks at the various okay. out sort of like endpoints that we're looking at. So one is, uh, you know, ascertain COVID cases versus general population. Okay. So, you, so, and those can, that can be kind of taking all comers as well ascertained by their healthcare system in these various basins um, and saying, you know, genetically, what, what, how do they differ if at all from their neighbors in the same population who have been screened genetically, but have not shown up in a clinic with a case. That's okay. endpoint number one. That's kind of the biggest, broadest one. But then we also look at hospitalized versus non-hospitalized or hospitalized versus general population. And then the a, a sort of extreme severe phenotype form. There are various definitions for that. As as a non clinician, I'm less familiar with the exact criteria that go but, into this. But is it? But there's no um. Is it the case that it's the same genetic loci that's in all of these separate endpoints? Um, okay, Good. that's interesting because it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. yeah. The answer is no. The answer is I a see. qualified no. Some of some of the peaks, some of the <laughs> the spikes on 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 our landscape uh, of the genome. Um, do show up for multiple endpoints. So they may, it looks like they may contribute to susceptibility to catching the virus and, and also contribute mm -hmm. to severity. Others, such as one on chromosome 21, the gene called IFNAR2, which is an interferon receptor, it's <clears throat> a, a classic immune, immune biology that kind of shows up and, and it like, you know, grabs you by the lapels. Um, that one really shows up much more strongly for who gets severely sick. I see. Then who catches it? By make, contrast, I'll give you another con yeah. you know, uh -huh. contrast example. Mm -hmm. it may, I, I'm glad to hear it makes sense. And yeah. it, it did even loosely to me as a non-expert. But another uh, on the other end of the spectrum is a, a gene like ABO. So the, the classic blood group locus, mm -hmm. you know, are you, do you have type A, type B, type AB or O? Um, reproducibly, folks with type O blood appear to resist getting into the system as having COVID-19. Um, across basins. And it's a, it's a modest effect, but again, very significant. It shows up robustly. Um, but that 
that the, the ABO association kind of, it, it kind of fritters away by the time you look at severe cases versus non-severe. It looks like it, that might mo have more to do with our bodies gating to the virus itself versus the interferon biology that shows up in IFNR2. Mm -hmm. And it shows up also in another couple of genes that are um, direct. So there's another uh, cluster of genes on chromosome 12 mm -hmm. um, called OAS1, 2, and 3. Those are classic enzymes that get turned on by the body to degrade double-stranded RNA. When the body sees mm -hmm. double-stranded RNA, it basically thinks, wow, we've got a virus trying to reproduce itself because our own RNA typically doesn't really fold uh, very much into double-stranded form, long, you know, long double strands. But viruses reproducing do. And so we turn on these genes to, to cleave it. There turns out to be a, a hit on chromosome 12 that is again implicated uh, more in severity and a couple of others that, that sort of figure in that kind of like uh, constellation of, of classic immune biology ones. Let me mention on chromosome three, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm kind of throwing, oh, no. yeah. I'm, I'm uh, regurgitating what, what we've kind of excitedly learned here to somebody who's more clinically um, expert to think about it. But on chromosome three, the, the spelling, the little cluster of spellings mm -hmm. that shows up as relevant sits right between two very interesting genes uh, immune wise. One of them is a gene called SLC6A20. It's a solute carrier, to, it's a protein embedded in our, uh, in, in the membranes of some cells that kind of gates ion flow. That one has been implicated in um, classically in, in some other kinds of viral biology in, I think in, in, in influenza biology, how we, our bodies respond to that, perhaps in HIV um, load control, et cetera. On the other side of this little peak, there's another cluster of genes called, that are chemokine receptors. So CCR1, 3, 9, and, and a famous one called CCR5, which you may, you've probably heard of as, as being crucial to who gets HIV-1 HIV or not course, if exposed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the one that, that Ke Jong Kui uh, tried to tinker with in, yes. in babies' genomes last yes. year before yes. when, when science uh -huh. had other stories. Um, <laughs> yes, so that uh, sits yes. really nearby, this hit. Uh -huh. It's basically just down, just down the block from this hit on chromosome 3 is CCR5. So this hit on chromosome 3 is really intriguing because it sits between these you know, solute carrier genes and chemokine receptors all of which kind of like, if you asked an immunologist to make a, a kind of like a usual suspects of intriguing, intriguing genes, they might name those along with interferons, you know, immunoglobulin genes, um, HLA and MHC genes as kind of places to expect to look. And sure enough, we're seeing that. Now, what we hope is that what we learn from this will be far, far, you know, before it becomes really predictive for any one of us in terms of risks. Because again, these are very modest differences in risk. The, the way I liken the, the risk difference is like, you know, today in Boston here, it, you know, a March day is modestly less likely to snow uh -huh. than a February day. Yes. Right? Yes. That's a very significant finding if you look back over the history of, of weather data. But if you really want to know if it's going to snow today, you don't, you don't rely on 100 years of weather data. You, you, you need much finer predictive analogy. Yes. Today, right? So, so none of this is going to be predictive strongly for you or me in terms of our own risks, but what it might do is help guide people who start to think about therapy development. Of course. Or, yes. or you know, screening an RNA signature to discern if somebody's going down a path towards severe COVID-19 versus uh, getting better. Those kinds of questions can benefit a lot from knowing what genes and in turn what proteins often or, or functional RNAs that get made by those genes are, are kind of swirling together in the, the thicket of biology that is this disease. And so we have, you know, this is our contribution to understanding what this elephant is. That's very interesting. I mean, and, and this was kind of what I was curious about. Um, I hadn't seen this and I still haven't seen your preprint, but I, I, I've been thinking that I, I wondered if this kind of thing was possible. Let me ask you this question. Um, my understanding is when one does these sorts of genome-wide association studies and these Manhattan plots, that the p-values you get out at the end, they are really significant. Like we're talking uh, uh, 10 to the power of negative minus 20 kind uh, of p-values. 30, 30 in this case, in some okay. cases, yeah. Okay, so that's what I was curious. So 10 to the power of negative minus 30. That's, uh, that's uh, but, 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 but then the other question I have is, um, um, what about reproducibility? So one of the questions that I get is, um, you know, often that these kinds of findings, um, there is some degree that they don't reproduce. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, so first of all, the, the study that we're talking about here, the effort, the global one, yeah. is actually a meta-analytic effort. So I what see. we're doing is we're pooling, we're looking at, <clears throat> at several at studies in different healthcare basins with all of which, you know, slightly different inclusion criteria for the studies. Um, we've tried to really harmonize the methods so okay. that we minimize variables there. But it's it's already looking at reproducibility kind of intrinsically okay. to the extent that it's it's meta-analysis where you can leave one out and see if it holds up, et cetera. I see. Um, now, most of the signals that we're talking about and that will get highlighted as the headlines in the preprint and elsewhere are ones that reproduce strongly from study to study. There are exceptions. And I should say, you know, when a, when a finding reproduces well, it, it encourages us to think that it, it's likely onto something. But you don't need to have reproducibility in terms of these findings necessarily from population to population for them to be valid. So mm -hmm. a finding can be valid if it doesn't reproduce in a different population in part because, for, for example, the spellings in question might not be it, it found in the other population. So they're not, you, you can't actually get enough statistical power to look in the other population. One of our findings, for example, um, the, the, the most distinctive risk spelling in that finding shows up among East Asian populations, but not much among any other populations on the planet. So you might look to reproduce it in other East Asian studies, other East Asian populations in East Asia yeah. or elsewhere yeah. in, in cosmopolitan places. Yeah. But, but, um, but you, don't, you don't need to have that, re that reproduced to say it's probably real. It, it, it can show up and be real. Um, it, that's a long-winded way of answering that they've sh they have reproduced most of the findings very well. Mm -hmm. um, and, we pr uh, and, and we've tried to control for, again, confounds like, uh, like, diff like ancestry. So you know, a, a good question, for example, that on this chromosome three finding that keeps showing up in different in studies, um, the the cluster of spellings that go together to, to apparently raise risk, uh, first of all, likely came down to people who carry them from a Neanderthal forebear, which is kind of a cool thing, um, but have ended up most common in South Asia. So Desi folk in South Asia or elsewhere in in the, in the diaspora um, are the ones who you know most are. The, in, in, well, they're the ones most richly carrying this particular cluster of spellings. Okay. Now that can get interesting, but people, you know, you want to not overinterpret that. Early on, for example, the pandemic swept through, you know, was, was really spreading fast in parts of South Asia. And then later it's really slowed. So all of this is much finer than the kinds of like hand-waving speculation that went on genetically early on. Like, right. oh, Maybe there's something, you know, maybe right. folks in Central Africa are, are, you know, tend to be genetically resistant. And that's why we're not seeing reported incidents there. Right. All kinds of other confounds there beyond specific uh -huh. genetic confounds to look for first in understanding it. age structure. Correct. Um, reporting and ascertainment, uh, prior exposure to other microbes. So, so many other things likely eclipse the modest effects we're seeing from our genomes. I just wanted to get on the board that we are seeing important effects in, in their place in the queue and understanding this. Okay, and then um, your thoughts on, you, you alluded to this a little bit, but so you think that the, the size of these effects is not going to substantively uh, explain differences between nations. Let's say also Taiwan, Singapore, Vietnam, you know, uh, that pocket of the world. Uh, th this, this won't give you enough to explain that. I, I think it's 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 going to modestly. This is you know I don't know if you ever played an instrument like but like you know like um, violins for example you uh -huh. could, you know you've got the pegs to tune it and then you've got the fine tuning little yeah, things. Yeah. Okay. These are going to fine tune things. Gotcha. Um, so you know Singapore has one international airport. There's one way in and out of the country uh, by air or by road from from Malaysia. Like that's probably a, and and that in a healthcare system that pays mm -hmm. attention and screens. Yes. Those are much more substantive effects. I would guess. Yes. Than anything distinctive about about you know the comp, the incredibly complex mix of genomes in a place like like Singapore among the cosmopolitan people there. So yeah, I would I I would very much caution. I mean, this is why we do it genetically. Why right. we don't just hand wave about like oh, you know, folks in country X must have some intrinsic resistance or something like that. This is why we go and say no. Let's look at people who share the same spellings, even if they never meet each other and they're cousins across the planet but their risks may modestly differ because of this. And again, the, the effect sizes here individually are on the order of, you know, um, 
0.8 fold to 1.4 fold risk or something okay. like that. Now, okay. how, how will they combine with other factors and each other over time? That's another open question. And how will they influence vaccine response and response to different strains of the virus? Like those are all open questions. This is the best studied virus, at least in an intense period of time, you know, in our history. Of any virus, and so, yeah. so it seems like this really vexing, incredible thing that that's like daunting. Yeah. If we looked at any, my hunch is if we looked at any infectious disease this intensively, we could start to disentangle these kinds of like host genetic effects, you know, strain effects, environmental exposure and, and policy and access effects, right? That's well put. Um, and uh, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, I think that um, the question of why countries do better than other countries, I think, is a complex question. Um, you know, I wrote an article about it and it has at least six things that we need to think about. I'm not going to remember them all off the top of my head, but one is you got to measure things the same. Two is you got to think about differences in the population, age structure, the density of the region. Three is, as you allude to, differences in how many ways there are to enter the country. Four is differences in initial events. When we all shut down in March, some places may have had few seating events. Others have a lot more. Um, you know, five is chaos, uh, stochasticity, randomness. Um, always a always a question. Um, and 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 our actions is is one of those things. Um, and then the final thing you're talking about is differences in biology, um, be it genomic, which is the thing you've studied, and other things that could happen in biology, such as um, biological exposures over time and things of that nature. So it's going to be a complex thing. I don't think we'll get an answer for at least five years, ten years, because I think when people are um, when emotions are high like they are right now, I think people are not in a good place to really answer it honestly. We want it to all be the actions of human beings because that means that some people did good things and some people didn't do as good and mm -hmm. we can learn from the good people. Um, that's that's part of a delusion, I think, that comes in, in these kinds of moments. But over time, we'll know to what degree our actions did actually make a difference and to what degree and which ones may have been superfluous. Um, yeah, and and I think you know at the other end of the spectrum there, there's always a risk in genetic determinism of of kind of like, you know, reifying DNA is at, like there's a genomic elect or something. It's right. the, the Puritan version where like oh there's you know it was destiny all along who gets it and who doesn't it. And clearly, I mean, in an epidemic, uh, you know, and it, that exposure matters most, right? You you got to have the bug there to get it. And um and, and I was thinking about that because like this this question this, this is a thought by the way to prepare people for coming headlines. We'll be hearing, you know, little stories about how the Neanderthal legacy, for example, has contributed to this. And it's a little complicated because the chromosome three cluster that, that confers higher than average risk came down to us today from Neanderthal uh, ancestry. But on chromosome 12, that, that um, OAS cluster, the resistant looking cluster of spellings Likewise, came down from a Neanderthal forebear. So there, you know, roughly about a fifth of our genomes, there's there's Neanderthal bits in various one people of us, and so they gave us a mixed legacy. So when you read one story, you know, in coming weeks about oh, you know, we got Neanderthal risk for COVID nineteen, you know, or, or lower risk or higher risk, know that it teases apart this complexity. Know also that immune biology may be we we may find that the parts of our genomes where Neanderthal or other disparate hominin ancestry where it matters most for our physiology may often involve immune biology. And we've seen that with autoimmunity, but the point I wanted to make was that it's we haven't actually studied it for very many other immune diseases, actual like, like infections. We've studied a lot for autoimmune diseases right. like rheumatoid arthritis right. and lupus and, um, and we, where we can look at over time how our bodies attack our own tissues and see what genetically differs in people who, who, who attack their, their own tissues. Um, but it's been harder to do without actually knowing that these little invisible scourges are there. So this one, this is a good example of the kind of research we'll see in future where future bugs and, and epidemics will hopefully get understood in part genetically faster because of the groundwork we lay for doing this well now. That's well put. Our time's up, Nathan Pearson, but it's been a pleasure. Thanks for this, uh, this uh, little bit of an, uh, a rejoinder to Plenary Session. My pleasure too. And can I can I make one more plug? Of course. Um, so in addition to the, the main effort worldwide, the folks in the US who are in the gift of life bone marrow registry, so who are volunteers for that, 
have already been screened for a, a really mysterious set of genes that are hard to screen in these other big studies because they're so diverse. Those genes are called HLA. So we actually have a crowd study where we can try to fill in that blind spot in our knowledge of how those immune critical genes may figure in this pandemic by taking a five minute online survey. And folks have, thousands of people have taken it already in more than 30 countries. If you are in the registry of Gift of Life, or if you know somebody who is, go check it out. Um, it, you can really, really help with crowd science. And it's just a survey. There's no, you, you can help if whether or not you've had COVID-19, whether or not you've even been exposed, helps gather good background data to distinguish the genetic effects from the environmental and kind of family exposure ones. And how can they find it? What should they Google to search? Uh, Google gift of life DNA study. That'll okay. do it. Okay. Nathan Pearson, thanks so much. Thank you.